choose to accept it. Just to make another freaking episode of Movie Gremlins already. It's been like three weeks. Jeez. This message will self-destruct in one second. Wait, what? <sighs> Hi. Welcome to Movie Gremlins. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the Mission Impossible series. First, how it's changed, and two, how Ethan Hunt has evolved as a character, and just a general feeling for the series as a whole. Now, the first movie most people think is about redemption. You know, he's accused of killing his team when he is, in fact, not. But it's not about clearing his name. It's about tracking down the man responsible for taking out his team. It's about finding justice and or revenge, depending on how you look at it. In fact, the part about him clearing his name doesn't factor in until the IMF takes his parents as hostage. If you're dealing with someone who's crushed, stabbed, shot, and detonated, five members of his own IMF team, how devastated do you think you're going to make him by marching Ma and Uncle Donald down to the county courthouse? Only then is he seeking out to once again get a place in the government's good graces. This movie follows a lot of the 90s tones about having like a very serious feel to it despite whatever ridiculous things may or may not be happening on camera. The battery of VX gas rockets is presently deployed to deliver a highly lethal strike on the population of the San Francisco Bay Area. You ain't even trying to compare body counts. Why? Uh, should I keep going all day? I'm, I'm out. Pick a flock of your finest assassins and set a meeting. Gotcha. Now, Mission Impossible 2 was a little bit less conservative. Now this movie was released in the 2000s, so it's more reflective of that era. Instead of having any sort of semblance of a serious tone like a previous movie, this movie just lets loose and has whatever zany, incredible, silly, action-y adventure that it wants to have. We are partners. Shake on it. The most elite crime-fighting force ever assembled. Now the theme of this movie, and Ethan's motivator for it, is love. This is demonstrated in scenes like when Nia is infected with the Chimera virus and Ethan refuses to kill her, even though from an agent's perspective, this makes a lot of sense, because she's going to die anyways, but because he cares so much for her, he's going to find a way to get her out. Just stay alive! I'm not going to lose you! And also the theme of love is carried out when the villain, Sean Ambrose's affection for her is the reason they're able to start this mission because he can't let go of his feelings for her. And on that front, um, the villain, Sean Ambrose, is almost an evil Ethan because they both have the same backgrounds of uh, secret agents and stuff like that. They're both in love with the same woman. In fact, Sean pretends to be Ethan twice in this movie, fooling two people who knew Ethan fairly well. Which is a little creepy, though I can't understand the appeal. Ah, gotcha. Now, in Mission Impossible 3, it follows the same pattern as the last two by um, being reflective of whatever sub, sub genre of action was popular at the time. And around this time, the Bourne movies were super popular. And this movie reflects that idea as well, with a noticeably cooler color palette, being super dark and gritty, and having a more serious tone overall. And it's kind of interesting how at least the first three movies were reminiscent of the time period of which they were made. So in this one, the theme, and Ethan's motivation, is family. Because he has to choose whether or not he wants to marry Julie, start a family with her and leave the secret agent life behind, or to rejoin the IMF, who is kind of the only family he's had up to this point. And this is further proved when the only reason he comes back is because his former protege dies, who he himself said he views like a little sister. Lindsay was like my little sister. And how, you know, Luther kind of treats him like a son. Thank you for coming. That's my job. One thing a guy that gives this movie credit for is not even explaining what their MacGuffin, the rabbit's foot, even is. Because they realize ultimately, it's not that important.
Now, the interesting thing about Ghost Protocol is it didn't have any action film subgenres to draw upon, mostly because of the rise of the superhero film. But what it did do is create its own unique voice by combining the tones of the previous three films into something wholly unique and interesting. I have to say it's probably the strongest in the series so far. <sighs> Another interesting thing about this film is that it's not about Ethan. It's about his team. And each of them has their own motivations for joining in on the mission. You know, you got Agent Carter who wants to take out the assassin that killed the agent she was handling. You have Benji, who just got promoted and wants to prove himself as a field agent. And of course you've got Brant, who feels responsible for the death of Julie, Ethan's wife, and wants to make it up to him. I leave two men with a wife. When I get back, my guys are unconscious and the wife is gone. Local police found her body three days later. So you might wonder what Ethan's motivation is on all this. Well, the fact is, regardless of how the third one ended, he doesn't have Julie anymore. So, the only thing that keeps him going is his mission and his team. Now the next film, Rogue Nation, that's all about responsibility. Because Ethan feels responsible for the record store girl's death. As a result, he's further motivated to take down Solomon Lane. Of course, he also feels responsible for Benji when he's tied to a bomb at the end of the movie because he's the reason Benji was there in the first place when he realized he couldn't handle it all himself. And I have reason to believe he's going to be here tonight, but I can't find him alone. So he takes responsibility for that, unlike British intelligence, who were kept the syndicate in the shadows because they didn't want to admit that they were responsible for the creation of it which is the reason why the Prime Minister didn't want to create it in the first place, because it was a team with zero accountability, zero responsibility. Which I alone would control. It would have made me judge, jury, and executioner with zero accountability. Now in Mission Impossible 2, we had an evil version of Ethan. In this movie, Solomon Lane is an anti-Ethan, whereas Ethan will do whatever he can to accomplish the mission, no matter the cost to himself. Solomon Lane will do whatever he can to fulfill his mission at the cost of others. He doesn't take personal responsibility, he just uses people. Ian does it all himself, and is reluctant to use other people when it puts them in danger. Now, Mission Impossible Fallout. Oh, don't worry about that, that's just the uh, spoiler alert. Anyway, the things that happen in this movie are mainly the result of Ethan's past actions, like his decision to leave IMF in Mission Impossible 3, and his decision to come back in Ghost Protocol, and even his decision to let Lane live at the end of Rogue Nation. And of course, to let Luther live instead of trying to get the plutonium, um, choosing, not choosing Luther's life over the lives of the millions he could save. Now this one doesn't have its own unique theme. It has many, it has like responsibility you can clearly see. If he had held on to the plutonium, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Team, of course. His team would be dead. Yes, they would. That's the job. His family. How is he? Oh, you know, same old Ethan. Love. You need to walk away. Please don't make me go through you. Revenge, especially in Lane's case. And the blood will be on your hands. And it has all these complex themes because it's kind of supposed to be the result of all the movies that have come before, all the decisions of not just Ethan, but the past filmmakers. But one theme that's in this movie that hasn't really been in the other films is Hero. Because that's what Ethan has been in this entire series. Because he doesn't do what he does for duty, or for money, or for glory, or even for love of his country. He does it because he loves the innocent and the people that he personally cares about, whether those are members on his team, past lovers, or current flames. Because the entire series started off with the people that he loved and cared about dying. And he hasn't forgotten that. I think with all that in mind, it's clear that this movie is meant to be something of a finale, um, I'm not saying they're not going to make more, they probably are, that's how Hollywood works, but it's just such a great period to the entire series, and just brings everything together, and it just 
makes one great cohesive long journey of Ethan Hunt and the people he's had to rely on. Anyway, that's all I got for you this week. I hope to see you back here again real soon. Bye-bye. Let's see what's in here. Pick up the wrong case. This was not a good idea. Whew. I'm a bit of pain. Matt! <laughs> Come on, Ethan! His choice to let Lane 